Hello, welcome to the next A-level lesson from the conscientious biologist, Ben Gallagher. Now, this is the first of three really, really, really important lessons. This is probably the most important concept in biology. It comes up all the time. It's worth loads of marks in the exams and it underpins so many other areas of biology. So you've got to understand this. Now, you should have already watched the lesson that I posted called Protein Biochemistry. That gave you some good background understanding and essential details so that you can access what we talk about now. So make sure you've watched that one before you watch this one, that's protein biochemistry. But this is the first of three that look at protein synthesis. And it's very important that you watch the three of them together. This one looks at the two main processes that happen within protein synthesis, transcription and translation. But the second one teaches you how to apply um, your knowledge gained in this one to translating the genetic code for yourself. It teaches you how to read DNA, basically. And the third protein synthesis video adds on the extra details to complete the entire protein synthesis section. I've broken it up into those three videos because I didn't want to make a one hour big video. But it's really important you watch those three. If I was teaching this to my class, we'd probably spend four hours in class. The three videos amount to about an hour. So invest an hour, learn this process really, really well. It will pay off in the exams. As always, please do subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't done so already, and do check out all the additional material that I put on Instagram and Facebook. Thank you. Now, we're not going to waste loads of time on GCSE recap because we've looked at that in the cell biology. We've looked at it in previous videos. You should know that DNA codes for, for the instructions for the amino acid sequence in polypeptides for how they make proteins. But we know that that happens in cells. And the first part of protein synthesis, which is called transcription, happens in the nucleus. So if I pull up a eukaryotic cell there, we've got the membrane, we've got the cytoplasm, you've got the nucleus in there, you've got the chromosomes made of DNA in there. Now, now, if you're going to do protein synthesis, the thing that does it is the ribosomes. Those are those red blobs on the rough endoplasmic reticulum that I've put just outside the nucleus. If you don't know what rough endoplasmic reticulum is, go back to my cell ultrastructure video and find out. Now, there's a problem here because the ribosomes need to read the genetic code, which is written in the DNA. But the DNA is in the nucleus. Remember, that's held in that double membrane, the nuclear envelope. And the ribosomes are in the cytoplasm on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So the thing they need to read is in the nucleus, but the ribosomes are outside of it. And the DNA can't leave the nucleus. It's too big to escape, even through those big nuclear pores in the nuclear envelope. So the DNA can't leave and the ribosomes can't get in. For one, they're fixed to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. There are some free ribosomes in the cytoplasm, but even they would be too big to get through the nuclear pores. So you've got a problem here because the thing that needs to read the DNA can't actually get to the DNA. So the solution for that is that you make a disposable copy of the specific DNA code that you want, and that's called a gene. One gene will code for one polypeptide. So a gene is the section that wants to be read. So you make a disposable copy which can leave the nucleus, that's small enough to get out through the nuclear pores, and it can get to a ribosome. So that's a messenger copy. Transcription that we're gonna look at now is how that messenger copy is created. It's the first of the two main processes. So if we enlarge the section of DNA up there, that might be the gene that we wanna read. This diagram should be familiar from my DNA biochemistry lesson. Again, go back and watch it if you haven't done already. Everything in my lesson builds on the previous. And if you ever come to something you're struggling with on your A-level course, it's probably because you've missed something foundational so you can't build on it. So just go back and look at previous videos, okay? But you should recognize this. This is a DNA double strand made of nucleotides. You should be able to look at that and identify the deoxyribose, the nitrogenous bases, the phosphate groups. You should be able to point to phosphodiester covalent bonds. You should be able to see where the hydrogen bonds form. That's between complementary base pairs. If anything I'm saying doesn't make sense, go back and watch that video, DNA biochemistry. Now for simplicity for this one, instead of the complex full diagram here, I'm just going to substitute that biochemical diagram for a more simplistic one here, just showing the nucleotides in different colours with the bases sticking out, just so we haven't got to worry about all the complexity of the rest of the biochemicals. Now if that's your DNA double strand. 
you should know that we can label those strands as the coding strand and the template strand, the coding strand that actually carries the genetic code. Remember, you need both of those strands for DNA replication, which was in a previous video, because they're both going to separate. Each one can then be built on to make your two new strands. But if we've got the coding strand and the template strand, what needs to happen for transcription to occur is we need to open those apart from each other so the bases can be read. So locally, around that one gene that you need, the strands separate. That means the hydrogen bonds between the complementary base pairs are going to break and the strands will separate. I've got to see sneeze stuck. OK, so if they're going to separate. Um, that means now that RNA polymerase can move down through the strand and as it moves along, it's going to make a copy of, notice, the template strand. But remember, it's not an exact copy. It's a complementary copy. So in other words, if you're making a strand that's complementary to the template strand, then it should be the same as the coding strand. So by copying the template strand or com do making a complementary copy of the template strand, you've effectively made a new coding strand. Now, there is a little bit of a difference here because this molecule that I put in black, this is mRNA, M for messenger. This is the messenger molecule that we've been talking about. But no, it's RNA, not DNA. DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid for the deoxyribose sugar. RNA has got ribose, not deoxyribose. So it's a slightly different sugar. That's where the R, not the D. But there is another chemical difference. By the way, in the third video on protein synthesis, we look in more detail at the differences between RNA and DNA. But for now, I want you to know a couple of things. Firstly, it's got that ribose, not deoxyribose as its sugar. But secondly, look at how the base pairing works. G with C, that's as expected. Again, C with G, as expected. Look at the next one there. It's an adenine on the template strand. So you should be looking at the one below and going, well, that should be a thymine. But RNA doesn't have thymine. Instead, it has the U. A U is for uracil. RNA has uracil so that the cell can recognize that it's RNA, not DNA. Um, that's because if you've got a bit of genetic material floating around in the cytoplasm, the cell can quickly sort of scan it, check it, and go, oh, it's got uracil, it's RNA, it's supposed to be out here, it's on its way for protein synthesis. If the cell checks a bit of DNA in the nucleus and goes, oh, hang on, this has got thymine, that's DNA, that shouldn't be here, get it back in the nucleus. It's just a way for your cell to identify whether it's a disposable copy, the mRNA, or the original DNA that should be back in the nucleus. OK, if we just fill in the rest of it now, you can see the base pairings there, C with G, A with T, the other way around because there's adenines in the mRNA but you can see the uracils wherever there would have been a thymine that you can see match up to the thymines on the coding strand so you've made this strand that can now come out of the uh, double strand and it's going to leave the nucleus through the nuclear pores to associate with a ribosome on the rough endoplasmic reticulum you can see i've added on the diagram over there you can see the mrna moving out of the nucleus heading towards a ribosome the DNA strands themselves can then close up back together as if nothing uh, had ever happened and they're safe and secure and still protected in the nucleus. So this is transcription. It's how you get this temporary mRNA copy built from a DNA strand. Right, process two, or stage two, this is translation. Now, this is the one that in the next video, Protein Synthesis 2, I'm going to need to teach you some more subtle key details on how you can translate DNA for yourself. But in this, we're just looking at the process. OK, so you've got the mRNA strand. This came out into the new uh, out through the nucleus, remember, through the nuclear pore, through the nuclear envelope into the cytoplasm where it's going to associate with a ribosome on the ref and plasmic reticulum. So there's a ribosome sat on it. Now, notice the ribosome is sat across six bases. But it's only going to read three at a time. Those three bases that it's going to read are called a codon. So the first codon on this mRNA is GCU. OK, the reason why it sits across two is to be more efficient. So while it's dealing with the first one, it can be kind of getting the second one ready. And as it does its job, 
that next one is kind of um, queued up, ready to go. OK, it's just to make it more efficient. But the ribosome is going to sit on there. It's going to read the first three bases that code on. And then we've got a new molecule, something called a T RNA. It's still made of RNA, so it's still got ribose, it's still got uracil, but it's different in how it looks. I'm going to show you a tRNA up here above me now. Now, if you look at it very closely, you might need to lean into your screen, but you should be able to see that that tRNA molecule is made of nucleotides. Look at them, you can see them. I've, I've changed the colours, they're not as brightly coloured as the original nucleotides, but you can see here that it's made of adenines, cytosines, guanines, and uracils. Okay, so this tRNA molecule must have been transcribed, like we saw in the previous slide for transcription. It's been transcribed, but tRNAs are specific. They are of a shape and a sequence where they will then fold into this exact shape. All tRNAs have this clover leaf shape with the kind of three leaves coming out from it. Okay. And on these tRNAs, there's two really important parts that you, you will need to mention. Almost always in the exam, if it asks you about a tRNA, it will be a two mark question to talk about two things. Firstly, it's these three bases closest to me, closest on the bottom here. I'm going to enlarge them to exaggerate it. But those three bases at the bottom are called an anticodon. Now, the anticodon on tRNA can vary between tRNA molecules. So this one you can see is CGA. Okay, so tRNAs will have an anticodon, which hopefully you should be linking in your head, must be linking to the codon. And at the top, they have attached this molecule, which you absolutely should recognize from the previous video on protein biochemistry. That's an amino acid. OK, now for simplicity for this slide, instead of showing the full amino acid there with the carboxylic acid group and the amine group and stuff, I'm just going to put it back to one of the emojis that, like I've used previously to represent an amino acid. So this is a tRNA molecule. I would suggest take a screenshot of this just so you've got it in your notes, because I'm going to fade that out in a minute to go back to my other diagram. OK, so take a screenshot of the tRNA if you need to. OK, but I'm going to get rid of this to show you what this tRNA does. It's carrying a specific amino acid. So that amino acid at the top there, the guy with the moustache, he would be specific to an anticodon. Technically, the anticodon is specific to the amino acid because there can be more than one anticodon that codes for the same amino acid. But we'll get to that in the next video. OK, now if I fade that out, the next thing that happens over here, once that ribosome is set on the mRNA, is it needs to recruit a tRNA. It might recruit loads, checking them all. But when it gets the one that's complementary, if you look in the circle there, the anticodon and the codon match. Okay, you can see guanine and cytosines, adenines and uracils, they pair up. So if it matches, the ribosome can go, ah, brilliant. This is the tRNA I wanted. This tRNA matches its anticodon to my codon. Therefore, it must have the amino acid that I want. So the ribosome takes the amino acid and kicks out the tRNA molecule. And by taking the amino acid and kicking out the RNA molecule, you get this, the first amino acid in your polypeptide. What then needs to happen is the ribosome is going to move down the messenger molecule to the next grouping of six. So it's now reading the next codon, which it had already started to get prepped before it moved down. So its next codon, if you look at it now, is that CAG. Yeah, CAG is the next codon. OK, now once it's moved down to that codon, it can start to recruit another tRNA molecule and just start to repeat the process. So it's going to check, check, test loads of tRNAs, but when it finds the one that fits, like this one, you can see again the pairings, the anticodon and the codon match with their complementary base pairs. It knows it's got the right one, so it does the same thing. It takes its amino acid, kicks it out, and peptide bonds it to the first one. We covered peptide bonding in the previous video. That's where the um, carboxylic acid group and the amine group of adjacent amino acids lose H2O, so it's a condensation reaction, and form a peptide bond between them. Go back and check it if you're not sure about peptide bonding. And then, of course, the process just carries on. So it moves down another codon, recruits another tRNA, make sure that tRNA fits, it fits 
takes its amino acid, peptide bonds it to the other ones, moves down to the next one, and so on, checking it each time until we get to the end of the mRNA strand. Obviously, normal mRNA strands are way longer than mine. They'd be you know, hundreds, if not thousands, of nucleotides long. Mine's only like 12 long, okay? But when it gets to the end, the ribosome can come off, it can release that polypeptide, and the polypeptide will now enter the body of the rough endoplasmic reticulum, find its way to the end, get packaged up in a vesicle by pinching off. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go back to the cell ultrastructure lesson where I showed you how the vesicles form. And that vesicle can now float through the cytoplasm to the Golgi apparatus for folding and processing. Now we covered protein folding in the last lesson. This was the screen from the last presentation that I gave you. So you might wanna go back and look at that because we're not covering protein folding again. All we're covering in this video is the transcription and translation. Now it can go on to protein folding. OK, right, let's jump on from here. That's a lot of information I've thrown at you. It's a very complex process. So what I'm going to do now is give you an exam style summary. I'm not going to read through everything that I put on the screen. That's for you to do and, and to, to revise from to make sure you've got your key terminology. But I think step one in protein synthesis was the transcription. That's going from the DNA to the mRNA. If I were writing it up, I'd write this paragraph. You can see what I've highlighted in purple. Those are my key words that I know would be in the mark scheme for an examiner looking at it. So you've got to get lots of detail in. OK, the next stage is translation into the polypeptide. So there's my explanation for translation. I know that polypeptide has then got to fold into its final shape. So here's my explanation for folding. Have a read through it. Pause the video. Look at it. Make sure you understand everything that I've written here. And when you are writing your explanations for these, this is the level of detail that is expected. Anything less than this is going to get you an inferior mark. So try and revise this level of detail. Now, please go straight now to protein synthesis too. We'll take a little bit of time revising this one, making sure you know all the stages. But what we're doing in protein synthesis too is doing it for yourself. I'm going to give you a piece of DNA code and you're going to work through to get the exact amino acid sequence. And I literally mean you're going to be able to name for me, right, it's proline, tryptophan, um, whatever, going along. You're going to tell me exactly how this works. That is a skill that you must know and that comes up every single year in the exam for lots of marks. So we're putting what you've just learned into practice, getting ready for the exam. Really important that you head there next. Please do give this video a like if it was useful. Do subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. And do have a look on Facebook and Instagram for all my additional bits of biology. Thank you very much. Good luck. Head straight to the next one, mate.